is Jennifer Wisebrode and I am the Pesticide Safety Education Program Coordinator for the State of Nebraska and we have Amanda here with us again who's going to help us show you a little bit of how to do a jar test. So pesticides are an important piece of any management uh, strategy and they are one of the last tools you're going to have so it's very important to understand pesticides, the formulations you're using and some of the risks associated with their use. One of the most important things is to understand what a pesticide is. A pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. When applying pesticides, there may be situations where you might want to do something called tank mixing. Tank mixing is where you would mix two different chemicals together, whether that's an herbicide and an insecticide, or it's two different types of herbicides. There are a few benefits to being able to tank mix. One is that you can control multiple pests. Another is that it can reduce the number of times that you're applying pesticides. So instead of going out and applying multiple times, you would only have to apply once or twice. Uh, and then another really beneficial thing is that you can help reduce resistance. So if, for example, you have a weed that's resistant to glyphosate, you could then turn around and add in another chemical that might help mitigate the resistant weeds that are left over within that group. However, when tank mixing, there are potentially some different chemical interactions that can cause crop damage or site damage. So if you're applying it to grass, you could potentially burn grass. It can also potentially clog your equipment, which is very expensive, a waste of the herbicides or pesticides that you're using and it can cause a non-uniform application which then can increase resistance as well as potentially if you don't have the right amount mixed in with it you can create resistance by not having enough of the chemical or having too much of the chemical and and not following that label requirement. I'm going to demonstrate physical incompatibility using some road salt or I guess sidewalk ice melt and baking soda. So I'm going to add some water to my jar, and then I'm going to add some of our sidewalk ice melts. We're gonna put the lid on, and we're going to let this dissolve. It's already starting to dissolve. So I will go ahead and add the baking soda to keep this demo moving. And so this is an example of using two different dry formulations. So we have a powder and we have a granule. One thing as this reaction gets going is we are gonna have some gas formation and it is going to bubble up. So this is something that you may notice when you're doing a tank mix and this is also one of the reasons why we want to practice on a small scale before you throw it into your main equipment. The other thing that adding the baking soda does is it causes a precipitate to form. So we did this demo and then let it settle so that you could see the solid that essentially pulls out of this liquid formulation and this solid is what's going to clog up your nozzles and then you're gonna to have to go through and clean them out or otherwise experience the consequences of a poor application. So now we're going to look at another type of chemical interaction. We already saw a precipitate. This is an example of congealing. When we mix two chemicals together, it can sometimes cause a very thick substance within um, the mixture. A real life example of this is actually combining 28% nitrogen and 2,4-D. While 2,4-D ester is compatible with 28% nitrogen, 2,4-D amine is not. And so it ends up creating a sort of mayonnaise or salad dressings mixture, which you'd pretty much have to spoon out of your sprayer. It would be a mess to clean up. So what we're going to do now is I've already added water to our jar. And now I'm going to go ahead and add our vinegar. You want to agitate. And then we're going to add our milk. And agitate. Now that'll take a few minutes to happen. So we actually do already have a real life example here. We've already mixed this. I'm just going to go ahead and pour it into this jar so that you can see what occurred. So you can see there's some chunks in there. 
Now this would definitely clog up your sprayer. It would definitely create a non-uniform application. When you don't have a uniform application, um, you can end up with getting resistance because you didn't use enough of the chemical, and that can always create more problems out in the field as well as clogging your sprayer. So we just saw another chemical interaction where there was a congealing of the two chemicals that we had mixed together. And now we're going to talk about a third chemical reaction that can happen, which is the production of gas. There's a real life example of this when glyphosate comes into contact with zinc. It's not recommended to put glyphosate into a galvanized metal tank because when glyphosate interacts with that zinc, it causes a hydrogen gas to be released and it builds up within the tank. And if a spark or anything like that were to happen nearby, it could potentially cause an explosion. So we're going to go ahead and use uh, vinegar again as our glyphosate example. Um, so we're going to add our vinegar to our jar, which represents our glyphosate. And because we didn't add anything else, we don't have to agitate this one. And then next we're going to add our baking soda. And our baking soda is very similar to our sink in that it will cause fizzing. We're going to put our lid on. Now if this was a real life tank mix, this would be building up gas within our tank and potentially create risk of an explosion. So that is a third example of a type of chemical interaction that can happen and another reason why jar tests are extremely important. Our fourth example is going to go over what adjuvants do and why they might be useful in a tank mix. An adjuvant is anything that's an additive. There are lots of adjuvants on the market that you can add to combat some of the things that we saw with our demonstrations. There are things like surfactants, anti-foaming agents, safeners, and the adjuvant that you can use with your product will be on the label or on the supplementary material that the um, that the chemical company provides for your product. So make sure that you're using adjuvants that are labeled to use with your active ingredient so that you're not adding some additional incompatibility issues. Our demonstration here is going to be using oil, water, and our dish soap is actually going to be our adjuvant. So we have our jar here filled with water and we're going to add our, in this case, active ingredient, which is an oil, it's just some vegetable oil. And as I add this to my water, I can see that it's already beating up. So I'm noticing some incompatibility of my product, not even just with another product, but just incompatibility with water. We're gonna agitate this mixture so putting on the lid, shaking it up, and you can see pretty much immediately that we already have that oil layer and the water layer forming. If this was chemicals in your spray tank, this is when you would want to add an adjuvant in order to overcome this physical incompatibility. So we're going to take the lid off again. And in this case, our dish soap is our adjuvant. We checked the label. This is approved for use with our active ingredient. Going to add a little bit to our tank mix in our jar test here. And then we're going to agitate again. We have a little bit of foaming happening, which is something that you might want to take into consideration. But you can see that our mixture now is much more uniform. Our adjuvant is allowing our active ingredient to mix in and be applied properly. So now that we've seen some examples of chemical incompatibility and we've shown you some of the potential things you can add to your tank mix to make it a better application, we also want to remind you to follow the Wales or the Dales method. The Wales or the Dales method is adding your wettable or dry powders first to your sprayer tank water, agitating it thoroughly to ensure proper mixing, adding your liquid flowables and suspensions, agitating, emulsifiers and concentrate formulations, agitating, and then finally, as Amanda demonstrated, adding your surfactant solutions last. Though jar tests are important and they do represent physical incompatibilities that we can see, there are situations where you won't see any interaction, but there is still a chemical interaction. And there are a few different types of chemical interactions that can occur. These interactions are antagonism, which is when you add two products together and they subtract from each other. Another is additive, where you add two products together and they are as effective as they would be on their own. 
A third is synergism, where you add two products together and they multiply the effects of each other, making them much, much more toxic. And the fourth is potentiation, which is also a multiplicative effect, which would be similar to adding a surfactant that doesn't have any pesticidal control to a pesticide and seeing a multiplied effect of that pesticide. So when you have a situation like that, if you've mixed chemicals for the first time together, it's important then to check outside the area that you're planning to apply. So you would add some chemical to a bottle and you would go outside and you would spray that section to make sure that you didn't see any um, crop damage or lawn damage wherever you're applying it to. During this demonstration, we weren't using anything with an EPA registration number. However, if we were, we would want to read the label and make sure we were following the label directions on the PPE, personal protective equipment, that we should be wearing. We wore gloves because we were actually using something that does have a signal word. Turns out road salt has a signal word of warning on it. But if we had been mixing in our shop for an actual pesticide application, we would want to be wearing more of a full kit, maybe chemical resistant aprons, long sleeves, closed toed shoes, whatever the label recommended. Now I'm going to take off my gloves. We inoculated them with this white powder, which is actually glow germ, so it's going to fluoresce, and this is to represent pesticide residue. I'm going to go ahead and take off my gloves and see how well I do in keeping the residue off of my hands. Probably did a pretty good job. The UV light is what's going to cause the glow germ to show up and it looks like I did a pretty good job on my hands, however, I do have product farther up my arm. In this case, I should have been wearing a long sleeve shirt and I'm definitely want to go, going to want to thoroughly wash my hands and my arms after I'm done with this application or also going home and taking a shower. So now that we've talked a little bit about tank mixing, the right way to tank mix, and some of the essentials of interactions that you might see, the next thing you wanna be able to do is calculate the proportion that you would actually be adding to your tank. So you need to have a smaller proportion that's the same as what you wanna to add to your spray tank. A few tools that you may need would be a compatibility test kit, which has within it a few bottles that will have marked 100 milliliters. You can make this yourself or order it online. It has the 100 milliliters marked on the bottle, some pipettes with a one mil marker on them so that you can add in the correct amount, and then some tools for measuring out of the actual container. Now it's important to remember that uh, these are designed more for liquids, where they are great for measuring liquid, liquids, whereas when you have something like a dry product, you probably want to use a scale as it will be more accurate.